Good morning, Family of Faith, and welcome to our online service. Whether you're joining us on Facebook or on our website, we are so happy that you decided to worship with us this morning. Get ready for some amazing praise and worship and an anointed service. Follow me and let's get this morning started. Um, we're going to do things a little different in our next group, which is our young adults, high school juniors through college age. We're going to have service in our cars at 7 o'clock at Family of Faith. So gas your cars up and we'll see you at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. What is up, Aunt Fam? Emily here. So excited for this upcoming Wednesday night. We have something really special in store for you guys. The group Forever Free is going to be putting on a virtual concert for us that night. So we'll get to have a time of worship. Because of this, we are actually starting at 6 p.m. instead of 6.30 this week. So be sure to log in to Zoom right around 5.50 p.m. and then we get to enjoy a time of worship before we jump into our normal Wednesday night services on Zoom. Guys, I miss you guys so, so much. I can't wait for everyone to come back. In the meantime, this is something really cool that we get to experience together. Love you guys. Oh my 
I want to say thank you for being a part of our service today, and I pray that it's been a blessing to you. Uh, I'm going to share some scripture out of the book of Luke, uh, Luke 23, verse 34. Let me read that to you. Uh, it reads like this. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes and cast lots. Would you pray with me right now? Father, we thank you for your faithfulness unto us and we thank you for this Easter season. Lord, we all have hope and joy in our hearts. We have a sense of being and belonging and purpose. And we just pray right now, Lord, you take the word, touch our hearts, our lives with it. And we'll give you the glory, praise, and honor. And everybody said, Amen. 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 I, I've thought about this a lot down through the years. Uh, how do you forgive someone who has crucified you and beaten you almost to death? When you study, and I realized last week was Easter, but I wanted to stay one more week in the Easter theme I wanted to talk about forgiveness. How do you forgive somebody who's done all of those things to you that they did to Christ? It's beyond my scope of thinking or feeling the struggle that Jesus went through, being beat with a cat of nine tails, made fun of. You know the story as well as I. You've heard other preachers preach on this subject uh, along with me. And it's cruel and inhumane punishment for anyone to go through what Christ has went through. Now they're parting his clothes, casting lots for them. So he's down to absolutely nothing on planet Earth. And his words were, Father, forgive them, 
but they don't know what they're doing. I thought, how did he do it? How, how did he do it? How, did, how does anyone forgive somebody else for committing this kind of a heinous crime against them? But Jesus didn't. And I think the first thing is, is that he was on a mission. He was on a mission to save the world. The world was lost and there was only one hope, one answer for the problems that the world had. And that was Jesus Christ dying and being resurrected on the third day. And so he had a mission. His purpose was when he came to planet earth was to fulfill the will of the father and to give his life as a sacrifice that the world could be saved. The reason why we have all the good things that we've got in our life today as Christians is because of the vicarious death that Jesus died on that cross. We stand today forgiven, not because of our good deeds or anything we've done, but because of what he did on that day. He had a mission and it was to save the world from their sins. It seems like that when you're on a mission, that, or a purpose in your life, you can withstand and you can take a lot of punishment or a lot of abuse in your life. I thought about all the missionaries that the various organizations have out on the field. They live in places where there's not electricity, there's not any food uh, to be eaten like we eat. Uh, there's no McDonald's, there's no Brahms. Uh, a lot of times they're just getting by eating food that you and I think is absolutely horrible, but yet they never complain. You know, pastoring this church, you know, there's times that we've had evangelists come by and, and uh, they would give us their request of what they would like. We'd like to stay in this kind of a motel. If you could help us, pastor, we'd like to eat at this restaurant because they serve the kind of food that we like to eat. But all the missionaries down through the years that I've had in this church, I've never had one missionary request anything because they'd been on the field, they'd been in the battle, and they knew exactly what it was like to eat what was put before them, sleep where the bed was made, and to do what they had to do to get the message. But they were on a mission, and the mission for them was the same mission Jesus had, and that was to take the message of Christ to a lost and dying world. That's how someone can live in the jungles and preach and share and send their kids off to a boarding school to be trained away from their parents six months at a time. That's how they do it. I, you know, nobody ever wonders how missionaries do it. It's because they have a mission, they have a goal set before them. And so it's easy for them to do. They want to take that message to the world. Jesus had a message and he was willing to die for that message. And the church has a message. The message that the church has is very simple. God will save you and change your life. And he'll be a part of your life in ways that you cannot imagine. And he will do things in your life that you cannot conceive. And every problem you ever face he will be there to help you up and over it or through it because that's his mission and he wants us as a church to have the same mission. I see and I, it bothers me or concerns me maybe uh, is a better word when I see a lot of churches that really haven't found their purpose yet. You know, our church, our first goal is we're a missions church. Uh, through this struggle that we've been going through with this pandemic, we've not been able to meet. We're a handful of us are meeting down here and we're uh, taping these services and uh, we have not had the income come in that we normally have. And we sponsor about 18 missionaries and it was brought to my attention that we didn't have enough money to pay our missions. And uh, I thought, my first thought was, we'll just struggle through it and somehow it'll all work out and we'll get caught up later on. But I had several people that they just kept saying, 
We got to take care of our missionaries. We got to have. We got to take care of our missionaries. Our church is a missions-oriented church. You know, it's one thing to reach the local community, and we certainly want to do that. We're a church with outreach. We're a church trying to reach into the community to touch the lives of people. We have all the problems in the world right here in Choctaw and Midwest City, and there's struggles and drugs and all the other problems that come with it. They're all right here, but we have a mission, and that is to reach those that are outside the four walls of the church, and it starts with our missionary program. As sure as Jesus had a mission to go to the cross, a church has a mission to go to the fields. We can't go. I can't go. I have never uh, uh, felt, I don't feel the call to, to be a missionary, but we have people that have, and our job is to support them and to take care of them. The scripture uh, fitting into this, Matthew 5 and 11, it says, Blessed are you when Men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Now, when I read that, I'm thinking as Christians, sometimes we receive the same welcome as Jesus received in his day. They got upset with Jesus and they crucified him. Sometimes as a Christian, when you walk into a room, uh, the conversation changes, things slow down. Uh, people get uh, a little bit concerned about what they're saying or what they're doing. And so it bothers them to a little, to a point. I mean, they're, they're, uh, they're uncomfortable around you. But let me say this, in some of these countries today, you have to understand this one thing right now. There's Christians dying for the cause of Christ today, right now. As I'm speaking to you, there are people around the world that are losing their lives because they're Christians and they're preaching the message that Jesus saves. So the message is going out and as sure as Jesus died on that cross, we have Christians around the world that's giving their life for the mission that God has put them on or sent them on. It's a struggle. It's perplexing. It's heartbreaking. It just renders us sometimes with that feeling of hopelessness. But as Christians, we run into a lot of persecution at times. And so it's easy for us as Christians to carry a grudge if we're not careful. You see, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. And he was saying something to the church. He was saying that not only do we have a mission to go out, but we have a mission to forgive and to go on and forget in our lives. It's easy to carry a grudge. I have dealt with people right here in this community, two brothers, hadn't spoke to each other in 15 years. They had a grudge, one against the other. You see it in families a lot. You see it in churches. There, there's people in our church, in churches, that have had grudges against other people in the church. And as bad as I hate to say it, you know, there's probably some people out there that's had a grudge against me. The minute you say, no, I don't think we can do that, some people just get upset, and it bothers them to the nth degree, and they carry that grudge. Well. You didn't do that for me, so I'm not going to do anything for you. But it's not just here. That's everywhere where people are because we just want our way. We just want what we want. We think the whole world should revolve around us. But if you're on a mission like Jesus was on a mission, Jesus was on a mission to take the punishment, take the cross, and to be resurrected on the third day. And so it was easy for him to say, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. I've often thought about the Near East and all the uh, beheadings and all the ways that Christians have died there. I thought, wonder what's going on in the minds and hearts of the family that's left. It'd be easy for them to carry a grudge and say, you know, uh, they killed my husband or they killed my child or they killed my wife. And uh, 
I'll never forgive them for that. And I've had people tell me that people had done certain things to them and they would say in a fit of anger, I'll never forgive them for what they've done to me on this occasion. And uh, I think that's sad commentary, but nevertheless it happens. Matthew says, Matthew 6, 14 says, for if, and it's speaking to the church, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So forgiveness has a, uh, an attachment attached to it that if you want forgiveness, you have to forgive. Now, if you won't forgive, God's not responsible or doesn't is not obligated to forgive you. That's what that scripture is saying. I've told that to a lot of people. I've had some of them scoff and laugh and walk away. And, and uh, I had one gentleman tell me, he said, that's just an old book with a lot of old sayings and it don't mean nothing. And I'm upset and I'm mad and I've been hurt and I'm not ever forgiving them. Well, that's fine, but God's not obligated to forgive you. You can say what you want. You can give all the reasons. There could be 10,000 reasons why you don't like him or her. And maybe they all have some validity and justified in your heart. But according to scripture, if you've got a grudge, you have to get rid of it in order to get your prayers answered. Many times I've had people come to me and they say, I prayed over this situation. I prayed over it time and time and time again. And it seems like that I can't get it. My, my prayers, get, they can't get any higher than the ceiling. I'm not getting anywhere in my prayer life. What is going on? Maybe it could be that you've got a grudge that you have not rectified. I believe the way the scriptures talk that if you have a conflict with someone, immediately go to that person and uh, beg for forgiveness and work it out, talk through it, talk it through and get it right. There's probably a lot of relationships that uh, marriages and friendships and, and maybe people on jobs where there's been a real riff because of certain things that's happened and maybe both sides won't forgive each other. But it's not as important that the other party be as in agreement with forgiving you as it is you forgiving them so that you can draw closer to God. You see, being a Christian is not about just building the biggest church in town. And it's not about having all the things that big churches have. It's not about all the pomp and circumstance. Being a Christian is about being right with what this book says. It's about being able to pray, pray prayers and have God answer them. It's about having the touch of God on your life. You know, I'm supposing, and I'm just thinking today that there's some people out there. We've got people, I've got friends in California and Oregon and Arizona and various parts of the country that's uh, listening in. They're, on, they're uh, Facebook friends. And, uh, and some of them are pastoring churches. And I'm just thinking that there's probably people in churches that they're just, they're just, they want God to move, but not to the point that they have to humble themselves and break the grudge. The way you break the grudge is you go to the person that's committed the offense against you and you say, forgive me for causing you so much grief. I don't know how, you know, I've preached along these lines. This is not the first message I've preached on forgiveness, but I still, in the depths of my soul, when I see Christ hanging on that cross, it just baffles me that he could look down and say, forgive them, forgive them for what they're doing. He was beat senseless, had a crown of thorns on his head. They mocked him. He had nails drove into his hands. 
He was so weak going up the Via Della Rosa that he couldn't make it all the way. Then Simon the Serene had to pick up his cross and carry it all the way up. There was not an ounce of mercy given to him, but yet the words that come out of Christ's mouth was, Father, forgive them. Forgive those people for what they're doing. I've come to save the world, but they've come to inflict punishment upon me. And sometimes as Christians, the people that come into your life come not to bring joy and happiness in your heart and in your life, but to inflict pain in your life. And they want to inflict the sorrow into your life because of the hurt that's inside of them. They want to hurt you. They want you. And there's an old saying, hurt people hurt other people. And that's true. When someone's hurt, they hurt everybody that's around them. And they can't help themselves because they've been hurt for some reason or other. I thought about carrying a grudge, maybe within relationships, but I want you to think about this. I know people that are carrying a grudge against God. Now I'm gonna tell you something. You might be able to out talk me. You might be able to uh, handcuff me, tie me up, beat me up, run me out of town. You can carry a grudge against me and there's probably not a lot I could do about it. But think about this, carrying a grudge against God, saying, God, I'm mad at you because you're not doing what right by me. He's the man that put the world in orbit, spoke it into existence. He's created all of this, he created you and I through Adam and Eve, spoke it into existence. He has all power. He put all of this together, and here we are, human beings, that a virus can hit us, and some have died within three days, but we want to carry a grudge against God, a God who has all the power in the world that can heal and change the lives of individuals. So you want to get mad and carry a grudge against God because he didn't give you all the things that you thought you needed to have or wanted? I'm telling you something right now. The first thing you need to do is when you're apologizing to people that you have offended and you're carrying a grudge against, you need to apologize to God and ask forgiveness for him because he knows what is right. And he knows what's happening. Before this coronavirus hit America, God knew that it was going to come. He knows all. Let's be very, let's be very honest today. We're serving a God that has all power. If you're going to carry a grudge, certainly don't carry it against God. You see, unforgiveness ties the hands of God. Now, let me... Let me share this. I'm going to move on to another thought. But if you're not getting your prayers answered and it seems like God's a million miles away, maybe the problem is where you're at right now in your spiritual experience with God. You have unforgiveness in your heart. You have unforgiveness. You're holding that grudge. If Jesus can forgive off of that cross, you can forgive off of something that somebody did to you. I had a man in this church right here get mad at me because I didn't shake his hand one Sunday morning. He said, I'm so mad I could just quit the church. And I said, what, what are you mad about? He said, you walked right by me and you didn't shake my hand. And I just immediately said, I'm just very sorry. I apologize for not shaking your hand. I didn't say anything to him, but I didn't sing. My mind was a million miles away. When you're starting service on Sunday morning, you have a lot of things on your mind. Uh, sometimes it's a million things on your mind to get the service started, but he was having a weak moment and I was having a busy moment and we passed each other and he was offended, but the, I just very quickly said, I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. Sometimes that's what we're going to have to do. Ephesians 4.32 says, Forgive each other just as Christ forgave you. You know, uh, there was a time when you needed God and you reached out to him and he forgave you of your sins. 
And I mean, he wiped the slate clean. He says, I will cast your sin as far as the east is from the west, never to remember it against you again, ever. That's the kind of God we serve. And some of the sins we committed was against God. But if he could forgive that group that was crucifying him and beating him, he can forgive you for what you've done in the flesh today. You say, preacher, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say you've not committed any sin that's too big for God that he can't forgive you of it. I hear it occasionally. People say I've committed too many sins. I've committed the worst kinds of sin. I've lived the worst kind of life. Nobody in their right mind would forgive me of my sins and love me. I'm going to tell you something. The thing that hung Jesus on that cross was the love of God. He loved humanity. He loved us. He died because he wanted to see us make a change in our lives. He can forgive you no matter what it is that you've done. He can forgive you. And I've got some thoughts that might help you get go in that direction, help you uh, understand how important it is to forgive. You have to understand why someone acts the way they do. Now, when I had this little run-in with this fellow, the problem wasn't me, and it really wasn't him, but he had some issues with some of his kids, and they had said some things to him, and so his feelings was hurt when he came to church. And he, was, he, felt, he felt very offended, not by me, but by his children. But when I walked by, that was just icing on the cake. And we solved the problem because I wouldn't let it go any further. And he started talking, we started talking. The second point is, is you have to feel and express your emotions as to why you feel like you do. Sometimes you need to get, to get together with God. You need to go out in the garage. You need to go to the barn. You need to go someplace where it's just you and Jesus. And you need to talk to him about how you feel and what's going on in your life. Don't pray around the problem, pray and just tell God, God, this is what's bothering me. This is why I feel this literally wrung inside out. And as you begin to share with him the things that are bothering you, you can get that off of your chest and you can say, Lord, forgive me. Many a time I've said, Lord, just forgive me for being so self-centered. Help me to reach out and not be so concerned about myself. Then you can begin to rebuild your life and you can let go of the problem. Now, let me tell you something. Some of you have had the same problem for the last 25 years because you make daggum sure that when you come to church, you bring that grudge with you can I hear an amen out there? You bring it with you because it's important that, that that grudge comes along because after all, it's cut a deep wound inside of you. When God forgives you of your sins and you make things right. Walk away from that thing that has been hindering you. Just leave it, leave it there. Just walk, walk away. Don't ever... Don't ever look back. Don't ever pick it up. Just put it, you know, my mother would say, put it under the blood of Jesus and go on and do what God wants you to do. I, and I want to close with this thought. There's a song sung by the Eagles called Forgiveness. Now, I know some of you listen to secular music like every one of you that's listening now. I know what that station's turned on. And they're kind of a soft rock group for those of you that still trying to convince me you don't listen to any secular music. I've heard this song before. And it's about a relationship between two people 
and the struggles that they're going through. Listen, if you're married or dating someone seriously, you're going to have issues. There's no perfect marriage. There's no perfect relationship. There's no perfect friendship. There's issues that you deal with because we all have bad days. And you can read the lyrics. I'd sing them for you, but it's probably better that I don't. A little humor there. But the words, when they get down to the end, the end of the song, he says the word forgiveness, forgiveness, about six times. And then he puts a line in there that says, even if you don't love me anymore. You see, when I heard that song for what it was saying, it went right straight to the cross. Jesus died to forgive forgive us of our sins. He loves you and he wants you to love him. But even if you don't love him, he still loves you. Forgiveness is for you. Forgiveness is there. The eagles aren't very far off on that song. Forgiveness is what makes relationships work. It's what makes churches work. It's what makes communities work. It's the thing that puts us together as Americans. It makes us work. Well, the problem we've got now in America is we've got too many people that's trying to defend positions and they're not trying to be Americans. We must come together. We must forgive one another, even if the other person doesn't love us like we love them. Would you bow your head with me right now? And we're gonna pray and ask God to just simply move right now. Father, I believe that there's folk out there that have carried grudges. They have some unforgiveness in their heart. They have things that they need to get right with God. And I pray right now, Lord, that everybody that's within the sound of my voice will begin to make it right. Lord, as we forgive others, forgive us. Lord, these prayers that we need answers for, I pray, Lord, as we forgive those that's trespassed against us, that you would help us forgive them. Even if they don't respond, Lord, help us to respond to them. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Good morning, so glad you joined us for this fantastic worship service. We have many things coming up this week. Wednesday night, super Wednesday night for the teenagers and young adults. There'll be a special promo on this and just stay on the internet and you'll catch all the information. Don't forget 10 o'clock Tuesday morning's prayer. God bless you. Check with us on the internet constantly. Bye-bye.